We welcome you today to the Bible study from Campbellsville Baptist Church. This is Charles Hedrick. We are now in a study in the book of 1 Peter. And so if you'll take your Bible and turn there, we will be actually looking in chapter 3 for today. Uh, the book of 1 Peter, I've kind of put a title theme to the whole book that I call The Unheard Message of the 21st Century. And in the book of 1 Peter, what we are emphasizing here is living the hard life as a Christian. Christians are being challenged in the world, in uh, Peter, uh, in, in the days of the early Gentile Christians, and as well as today. And we're in chapter 3, and chap uh, chapter 3, uh, I have a title on it, is suffering while doing good. Suffering while doing good. Last time we looked at uh, uh, the first part of this, verses uh, 8 uh, through, uh, or rather verses 1 through uh, 7, and today we're starting in verse 8 and hopefully being able to get through the re remainder of this chapter. And... Uh, in the first part of Peter's message on Christian suffering as a believer, he says there is actually blessings to that suffering. And we're going to look at some of what Peter has to say about the suffering for Christ's sake in a pagan world by the people of God. We'll be looking and starting here in chapter 3 in verse 13. If you'll open your Bible, let's read verse 13 and 14 to see what Peter is saying. He says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. Our hope as a Christian, not only today, but for these Gentile believers that, that uh, this letter is being written to, our hope is found in suffering. You know, our salvation comes through the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. And all through the ministry of Jesus, there were times when those who were his enemies tried to persecute him, create great suffering on him. And not only that, but when the disciples of Jesus went out into the world to preach the gospel of Christ, every one of them suffered for the cause of Christ. And every one of them eventually paid with their life. When you suffer for Christ's sake, Peter says here, don't worry about it. No one can harm you. You are already the victor through the suffering and the price that Jesus Christ has already paid for you. So don't worry about it if they try to persecute you or create problems for you and suffering. Now this sounds a little hard to believe. Jesus warned his followers, don't worry about one that can destroy the body. Be worried about the one who can destroy your soul. Now, what was Jesus talking about? Jesus said your body is living in a temporary dwelling or temple, and your body one of these days is going to die and you're going to be with me in glory. So don't worry about what they can do to your body. Just be concerned about your soul, which means your relationship with Jesus Christ. The world may cause you to suffer bodily harm, may cause you to suffer emotionally. But our blessing that Peter is talking about is our hope in Jesus Christ who holds our soul in his hand 
and no one can pluck it out of his hand. That was his promise to his followers. So Peter is saying, don't be afraid to suffer for the sake of Christ. Now, I don't know many of us who love or enjoy or want to suffer in any way in our physical body, both physical or emotionally or whatever it may be. But sometimes if you take your stand for Jesus, there is a price to be paid. Look at verse 15 as Peter goes on in his message uh, to these uh, believers. Here's what he said. But rather, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, knowing and believing that you stand up for Christ in the world, there's going to be a price to be paid by you, suffering, pain, anguish, whatever it may be. And so Peter is saying here, you can expect that, but there's a way to handle this. This is the heart focus of every born-again believer in Jesus Christ. We live for Christ. We suffer for Christ. We suffer for His honor and His glory, not ours. As believers, we are expected that we will pay a price of suffering. If you never suffer for Christ's sake, it may be, first, you may not even know Him as your personal Savior. Secondly, if you do, you are not fulfilling your calling in this world by taking a stand when it's necessary. And therefore, the devil, the world, leaves you alone because you are no threat to them. But notice what Peter said to these suffering Christians. He said, be ready, be prepared to give an answer why you have this hope in Jesus Christ. Could you give an answer to that? If someone saw you really suffering for Christ's sake and you make a statement, well, I'm just trusting in the Lord that he'll get me through. The world, not knowing the Lord, very well would ask the question, well, what causes you to be able to do that? And Peter is saying, be ready to defend yourself. Be ready to give an answer. You know, too many of us as Christians can't answer what we need to answer to the world. That's why the world doesn't believe us. The world doesn't see anything in us. Sometimes that makes us any difference. So how will you be able to explain the hope that you have in Jesus Christ, even in the midst of suffering? Could you tell, for instance, an unbeliever in Christ why your hope is in Jesus? If you were witnessing to a lost person and they said to you, well, where do you get the strength and where do you get this hope and this great anticipation you talk about in Jesus Christ? Where does it come from? It comes from knowing Christ in your heart. Can you explain that to a lost person? who is asking the question. Notice what he says here in verse 16 as we move on in this message. Having a good conscience. That's how you can explain it. First of all, you've got to have a good conscience. You've got to have a clear mind of who you are in Jesus Christ. Have a good conscience that when they defame you as an evildoer, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed of themselves. That's very simple to understand, folks. Uh, the problem is, do we have the strength in Christ, the faith in his promises, to stand up even when we know we're going to face suffering and persecution? This is a warning 
in verse 16 for all believers. Do not retaliate, is one way to say it, against your enemy who is persecuting you, who, who is causing great suffering to come upon you. Remember what Jesus said, love your enemies and those who persecute you. And I'm telling you that it's not easy to love your enemies. Sometimes it's hard to love your friends, let alone your enemies. But your love for your enemy comes from the indwelling power and strength found only in Jesus Christ. And he starts that verse out by saying, have a good conscience. In other words, uh, don't be a hypocrite trying to tell a lost person how to live for Christ. Be sure you can back up what you say in your own life that an unbeliever needs to do in their life. Uh, we are not to get back or get even, retaliate. Now, sometimes you have to defend yourself. And that defending yourself is defending yourself as a Christian based on the Word of God, not on the mindset and an activity that man would uh, come up with to defend yourself against an enemy. In other words, he is saying, don't mistreat those who mistreat you or are causing you to have to suffer for Christ's sake. Don't retaliate by treating them like they may be treating you. That's our human nature. But you see, we have a new nature now. We have the nature of Christ dwelling, living in us. Peter says, what we suffer will become a witness or a testimony for Christ to the unbelieving world that sees how we endure the suffering and pain. We are to stand up for the truth as Christians. We are to speak up for Jesus Christ. That is our goal in an unbelieving culture. And as we show this kind of love and respect even to those who would persecute us, we remain faithful and true to Christ, and Christ uses that as our testimony and a witness of the power of Christ in our life. And some, Peter says, will be one to the Lord because of what they see in your life in mine. In verse 17, uh, Peter moves on. He says, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Notice, very simple word, but a very clear message here. If you have to suffer for Christ's sake, let it be the result of your faith and commitment to Jesus Christ, your willingness to be faithful to Him, your willingness to stand up and speak up the truth in your life as a Christian. It is better to do right for Christ and suffer for it than to be drawn into an evil a way of living and getting back at people, even though you call yourself a Christian, you are fighting against an unbelieving, lost world. And when they see that coming out of you and I as people of God, to them, our faith means very little. We don't mean what we say. And Peter goes on in this chapter in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once, for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in his flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. What a wonderful word of encouragement Peter is trying to give to these suffering Gentile believers. And what a wonderful word of encouragement for us. Christ has already suffered. He suffered far more than you and I will ever suffer. He suffered at the hand of his enemies. And still many became believers in him and followers of him 
when they witness his suffering, even his death and his resurrection. You remember the centurion at the cross when they crucified Jesus? He finally uh, died and said, Father, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit and his spirit went to be with his father. That centurion, Roman guard, enemy of Christ, enemy of Christianity, said, surely this man was the Son of God. If the world treated Jesus like that, they will treat us the same way when we take our stand for Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered to redeem us uh, from condemnation, from, from the pain and the anguish that we sometimes go through, Jesus has promised, remain faithful to him and you will be rewarded. And uh, he says there in, in that verse 18 that when Christ suffered, he suffered one time. In other words, he paid the price for all of our suffering that we may ever go through one time. He did it on the cross. And uh, uh, the victory was found not in his death, but rather in his resurrection back to life. And so he died uh, suffering for us one time that he might bring us, all people, believers, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said that, notice he made that statement by including the just and the unjust. The ones who've been saved, Christ wants to surround you, even in your suffering and pain, that he is with you. And for those who are outside of Christ, he wants them to be able to witness and see the testimony of how God's people can suffer and go through pain and anguish by the hands of this world and still remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then here in the next section, Peter moves in verse 19 through 22. Now, these verses can be misunderstood, I believe, or give the wrong, or we can easily give it the wrong application. So let's read them all together, verses 19 through 22. Uh, listen to what Peter says. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone back into heaven and is now at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject unto him. Now we want to try to take a look at this passage that can become a little confusing. First of all, when Jesus died, it says here in verse 19 that he descended into hell to pay for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Now, what does that mean? We can understand that Jesus ascended back into heaven after his resurrection, and that's where he is now. But what about this descending? He descends or goes down into hell itself for the sins of the world, your sins and my sins. But not only that, there are lost people who were saved before the coming of the Messiah, before Jesus died on the cross, and I believe he is going there to preach 
the gospel to them that they might have the opportunity to get uh, born again. This, I think, is particularly true of God's chosen people, Israel. This is a complicated biblical teaching, in my opinion, that can be misapplied uh, and understood. But let's just say that Jesus did everything he could, even in his death and going into hell itself for the sins of the world, so that people might have the opportunity to once again hear about the Messiah and be saved. Jesus preached in hell to all those who had gone on, particularly in the Old Testament, who did not know God. And they possibly are having that chance now to be saved. Will they be saved? I don't know. Some will. He gives some examples of some that have been. He talked about Noah and Noah's family, eight of them. They were saved. And so... Jesus preaches uh, to those who are in hell as well as paying for the price of your sins and mine who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus preached also, the Bible says, to those angels and authorities. Who are they? You remember when Satan was cast out of heaven? Uh, a lot of his follower angels fellow angels went with him. He took them with him because they were trying to overtake heaven and so God cast them all out. Where did he cast them to? Into hell. Even the angels in heaven or in hell know the plan of salvation that God has for them even though they rebelled and sinned against God and wound up in, in hell instead of in heaven. And Jesus preaches to them, shares the good news with them, including Lucifer. So what's the meaning of verse 19? I believe the answer is given in the scripture, in starting in verse 20. Uh, Jesus preached to the lost souls. He mentions like in the days of Noah. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I said. Those Jesus preached to were Human beings, not angelic angels who were thrown out of heaven. Peter speaks of a prison, that place called hell. It means you can't get out of it. Where, where is that prison? Every lost sinner that has died is now in that prison or that house of bondage, the place we call hell, Hades separation eternally from God. But listen, let's carry it just a little bit further. It can also, that prison can also mean the location being the, what the Bible refers to as the final dwelling place of all unbelievers, none other than hell, and they will be there for the rest of eternity, bound in the bondage of sin that caused them to reject the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Only eight people he mentions here were saved in Noah's day. Think of all the people on the earth in Noah's day, and only eight of them uh, survived, and only eight of them were saved uh, that knew God himself. Those eight were Noah's family. All the other people on the earth died in the flood. They were lost because they had rejected the message of salvation preached by Noah for 120 years as he was building the ark. All but these eight people rejected everything Noah preached during that 120 years. And they all went to hell. How was Noah and his family saved? Peter says they were saved by the God of the water, which was, uh, in essence, their Messiah. The water is what saved them. Now, we have those who believe in salvation by water baptism today. But remember when Jesus came 
He said, the way things were done in the Old Testament days, I come now as the Messiah in your presence that you can have a personal relationship with, and it's not by water that you are saved. It's not by church membership. It's not by good works. It's nothing you can do. It is simply the grace and forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ who suffered and died on the cross for your sins. So what is this water baptism? Well, in the New Testament, uh, water in verse 21 here, we read about it for the Old Testament. Uh, the word water symbolizes a type of salvation. It is not salvation. It is an expression, an illustration, an example of being buried in Christ and risen as a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. Water didn't save Noah and his family. It was their faith and trust in their God. God saved them. What was the meaning of, uh, uh, of this water baptism? Uh, in, in the form, in uh, to the, to the life of those who are already dead. Water does not save a soul; never has. It's the blood of Jesus that saves souls. It's the resurrection of Jesus, the victory over death, that saves the lost sinner and removes the pollution of sin from their soul and gives them eternal life in what Jesus did for the lost sinner and not what the lost sinner can do to help himself find salvation or earn salvation. The water symbolizes our sins that have been washed away in the blood of Christ. And we who were dead and lost in our sins, like Jesus himself, have been resurrected rescued, you might say, from the old sinful life into a new creation, a life we now live by faith. Peter says here in verse 22, Jesus' death was for our sins. For what reason? To bring us into a personal relationship with God. If you live this testimony in an ungodly world, I can tell you there is a price to pay. Jesus paid the price. You and I can expect the suffering and pain because of our faith in Christ. This suffering does not bring us to a life of hopelessness, but Paul says suffering for Christ's sake brings us joy. There's joy in in. In, in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as he goes to prepare a place for you. So Peter says, do not fear what the world can do to you to make you suffer. You belong to God. Jesus promised you that wherever you go, however the world may treat you, he has promised to go with you to, be, to the very end of your life. While we may suffer now, we still have that peace that passes all understanding the humanistic world cannot understand. And we are just merely pilgrims passing through this pagan world, sinful world in which we live. Heaven is our home, not here on earth. Do you know Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior? Are you living for him every day, the best you know how, doing His will in your life, taking your stand for Christ, being faithful to Him, speaking up, stepping out for Jesus, letting the world know, do whatever you want to do to me. I belong to Jesus. And though you kill the body, He has my soul. And that is the victory we have in Jesus Christ. May we pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful word and promise that you are with us. And Father, even if we suffer, we suffer for Christ's sake to gain the victory.
of our home in heaven. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen.